We're all embarrassed and we all go, we all got hoodwinked like every single person. But I find it really empowering to actually admit all the stupid mistakes and admit that he fed me the most ridiculous lines and I just kept letting him be part of our lives. This week, con man Hamish McLaren, the subject of the hit podcast, Who the Hell is Hamish, was sentenced to 16 years in jail after stealing more than $7.5 million from his victims who included girlfriends and exes and good friends and even relatives. One of those victims was his ex-wife, a woman called Beck Rosen. Hamish came into Beck's life after she'd left a really terrible marriage and made her feel he was someone that she could trust. Except she couldn't. Because in the years that followed, he tried to steal her parents' home, he drove a wedge between her and her children, and he had an affair with her son's 17-year-old girlfriend, ruining so many lives in the process. In April, Beck came into the studio here at Mamma Mia to tell me her story. And now that Hamish has finally been sentenced, I thought it was a good time to revisit the story that explains why exactly he deserves to spend the next 16 years behind bars. Here's Beck. So many people who have listened to your story just said that the word gaslighting just yeah. came through the head. Gaslighting, gaslighting, gaslighting. Everyone was telling you, or he was telling you, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy, Everyone you're crazy. Was telling you. The therapist was saying, you're crazy. Jane, your son's girlfriend, you're crazy. Everyone was saying, you're crazy. Yeah. My kids. You are not crazy. <laughs> you have never been crazy and your instincts have always been spot on. Which is such a learning lesson. And it was so difficult because I knew in my gut I was right. Yeah. But I was on this knife's edge because I had the boys and I couldn't, you know, can't create this massive blow up disaster because I, they'd already been through enough with my first marriage. And I just... Was, I think the whole time I kept thinking, I'm going to be able to, to show them and I'm going to be able to work this out, but I have to do it in a way that's not going to just, just completely blow up their whole world in one second. And you didn't want to be right, did you? Not like, really. It would have been awesome to be wrong it in that case. You know, not to be crazy, but... It would have been so good to be wrong. Yeah. But I knew I wasn't wrong. Tell me about your life well, right before... You met Hamish right before he walked into it. Well, the kids and I had lived in Singapore for seven years with my ex-husband and he, unfortunately, was the absolute love of my life but had a big problem with alcohol and violence and cheating. So we'd sort of got through a few of those things and, you know, he'd had time in rehab, we'd gone to counselling, I'd forgiven him about some of the women and we were trying to work together but it would always slip back into a disaster and I remember being at a counsellor, this great woman in Singapore, I can't remember her name, I wish I could. And she said to me, Beck, you're a mother of three boys, right? And I said, yeah. And, you know, they were 11, five and two or something. And she said, do you want your boys to think that this is a normal relationship? This is Mm. what a marriage looks like. And I went, absolutely no way. Because I was thinking, I'm trying to do every step I can to make this all okay. And she said, you need to get them and get out. And literally, I left that session, walked out, called my dad, and we were on a plane in like three days. So I left thinking, we're just going to go to Bluey's because I'd grown up there since, since I was two, we'd been holidaying there. And we had this little holiday house there. And I rang and said to dad, look, can we just rent it for a year? And I'll just work out what I'm going to do. Fresh start. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a really simple life. There's a cute little primary school. And so, so it's like a small coastal town yeah. in New South Wales by the beach. Yeah. Uh, everyone knows everyone, you know. The postman will come and find you if you're not home to give you your letter. And my really old girlfriend and her partner had bought a business like three months before I moved there. And what year was this? So that was, I moved there in January 08. And... So the kids were getting settled in school? Yep, Jack started high school. That was a bit scary because going from a really nice school in Singapore to Foster High. Were you working? Yes, so they employed me. So they've got a bottle shop in Delhi. So I was just working there. Your friends? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm still there. Um, They've got two shops now and I'm the manager. But, you know, it's it's awesome. It's a beautiful shop. Tell me about the day you met Hamish. I just used to see him around and he had this beautiful girlfriend, Letitia. 
And I used to look at her and go, what are you doing with that guy? Like, that's weird. And she worked in a cafe down the road. And so we used to chat and she'd sort of talk about Hamish and how he was a futures trader. What did he look like? Fat, chubby, shaved head, stubble, always wearing sort of just like singlets and board shorts. And Attractive? Thongs. Not at all. No, not at all. That's why I kept thinking, why is that amazing woman with... Which is yeah, right. So just like a kind of a, a fading, yeah, surfy like sort of Like a fading, dude. surfy dude. And that's all he'd do is go surfing. He was really observant. He'd watch people. I noticed that. Like he'd say things to me like he'd notice some random thing about my car and ask me it. Or just like, you know, those rubber strips that are on the back of, I don't know, they're meant to stop static or something on the road. I didn't even know I had one. And, but he'd notice stuff like that and come and go, hey, why have you got that? You know, just little weird things. And then he started coming into the cafe and we were doing bacon and eggs rolls and stuff at that stage. And he used to just be the most annoying customer, like really particular, burnt bacon, egg has to be rock hard, no sort, you know, like all these things. And so we'd all stand there and go, oh, here comes that dickhead. And we'd all roll our eyes and start burning the bacon. And um, I can remember one time he was there and I got the egg off the whatever, the stove and I went to flick it on the burger and it landed on the ground. So I just scooped it up off the ground and put it on his (laughs) burger. We still laugh about that. So he started hanging around a bit. We'd have chats because it's a little community. Then he started whinging about Letitia. And I I think think pretty straight away I went, mate, I don't want to know. What was he whinging about? Like he says about every ex-girlfriend, she's got a drinking problem, she takes heaps of drugs which was so untrue. This girl was a, an athlete, played leg tag and all sorts of things. I can't stand how she smokes. She's got, she loses her temper every five minutes. Just, it's, it's quite funny. A lot of men like to whinge about their wives or partners to other women, which I just find so unattractive. Do you see now looking back that that was part of the way he would sow doubts about someone's credibility? Absolutely. With the drinking? Oh my God, you should hear the stories I've heard about me. Yeah. I was a drug addict and the kids didn't want to live with me. I'm a full-blown alcoholic. Because it becomes hard to deny something like that, doesn't it? Because if you deny it, well, you deny it if it was true and yeah. you deny it if it wasn't true. Yeah. So, And people don't – it's funny because people don't tell you because he's so good at keeping everyone separate. So he'd said all this stuff about Letitia and then I remember him going, we'd become friends and I knew the guy he worked with what was he doing as a stockbroker? Yeah, he, he, was, he said he was a hedge fund trader. One of those things that nobody really understands what that means. You know, big screens with the, like, graphs, yeah. and he'd just sit and stare at it. Now I think, how boring, because he wasn't actually doing anything. What was he thinking? Just staring at a screen for hours. But I remember Letitia was going up and down to Sydney, and things weren't great. And I was just really just in the bubble of the boys. And I think, as I said, he'd, he had spotted them because they'd get off the bus and they'd come and sit and I'd make milkshakes for them or whatever and you know they'd go home and get the dogs and bring them down because I was just like I could walk to work so it was a perfect situation for Mm. us and it was just really cute we were just all happy and regrouping and then he'd start going hey do you want to come for a surf and so they knew that I didn't like him because I'd go home from work and we'd laugh about him and I'd go oh that annoying guy came in today again and he just thinks he's so good and we used to laugh about him all the time. But then he just did stuff, sort of started being really interested in the boys, even probably more so than me. So I'd see them sitting outside with him and they weren't inside running at me, wanting my attention. You know, and stuff like I remember one time I was at work and it was super busy and the boys had were being stupid and they'd ridden their bikes down the street and one of them stood on the front handlebars and went face first. So they all run down in a line, the three of them, and the last one's, he's, he was like six when it happened, and his front tooth's like hanging out of his head and there's gravel off his gums. And I was at work and there was nobody else there and I couldn't do anything. And suddenly Hamish is there and just swoops in, picks Levi up, you know, takes him straight to into the doctor and then to the dentist and, and just kind of does the saviour thing. Mm. You know, wanted to know, everyone would always ask me about my life and and be horrified at, you know, what I'd been through. And I'd lived with my ex-husband saying, stop playing the victim. 
you know, you're such a victim. Look at you. So Hamish was interested in you and interested in your story. Yeah. Also was interested in the fact that before I left, we'd opened a business over there. Also was interested in what are you going to do about a divorce settlement with the kids and pushing me for sort of divorce. And I was like, look, we didn't really have money. All the money's put into the business. I don't want anything. I want the kids. I I don't care, you know. And he, he kept saying you really should think about it, Beck. I mean, what about a better education? I'm going to make an appointment. And he took me to some solicitor in Sydney that I just was felt so uncomfortable with. So he came in and he was the good guy between you and your ex-husband and he was the mediator. Yeah. And he picked up all the emotional labour of that, I guess. Love the emotional labour episode. I've used that term about 20 times in the last week. Because that's seductive for a woman, isn't it, when a guy comes along and says, hey, I'll take the kid to the dentist, I'll fix this, I'll do that, all that stuff as a single mother that you are used to having to handle on your own. That must have been an enormous relief. It was enormous and someone who seemed to genuinely care and someone who had your back and just was like, you know, you didn't deserve any of this. The boys didn't deserve this, you know. So that happened and around the end of 2008, things between him and Letitia had just really fallen apart. Looking back with what you know now, compulsive liars can't help but lie. I mean, they lie about inconsequential things like what they ate for breakfast. Yeah. And then pathological liars and psychopaths and sociopaths lie for, re- for a reason. To, yeah, for a reason and to manipulate the situation. Which kind of lies did Hamish's tend to fall into? Both? Both. Right. I think that must do a number on your head. Like I said, you know, he would lie about exactly inconsequential, really stupid things, but things that always made him sound a little better than he was. What were some of the things he told you about his own past? Oh, well, first of all, they lived in New Zealand, which is true. I mean... His mother had an affair. His father killed the guy that his mother had an affair with. They then fled New Zealand and moved to Avalon. He was then born. He's quite a bit younger than his... He must be like 12 years younger than his older sister. His mum was not in a good place and was was not a good mother to him, didn't understand him. His this fa- is all according to him? All according to him. His father was um, in the army and really strict and wanted Hamish to be really a man and, and really manly and and he never felt like he could make his father proud of him. Um, but he loved surfing, he loved Avalon. Then they were going to move away and because he didn't want to leave Avalon, well, he says he got kicked out of home at 16 and had to go and live with other people, which he did do. I, I don't think he was kicked out of home. And it's funny because I do talk to his sisters or I have over the years about childhood and, and it wasn't that. None of that was true. No. When did it become romantic? So it's the end of 2008. And I was starting to think, look, he's a nice guy. Look, maybe, you know, who knows? So he rang me and said, yep, she's gone. It's completely over. Do you want to go to the movies? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, and we went to James Bond, which just... Because <laughs> he absolutely idolises Daniel Craig. Like he, but at the time, I didn't know. And that led to actually him telling me other stories about when we were first together, he, he worked for MI5. And he, really? Yeah. So um, because of his big army history, he'd done things like worked for the special forces in the army, he told me, and done missions like for training, they would drop them out in the middle of a desert with a sack over their head and a bottle of water. And you had to get 100 kilometres back to base and he... He'd done it and, you know, he was a really, really good with weapons and anyway, all this stuff. So he... He made up this completely fake life. Yeah. What's interesting about the stories that he told about his past, though, is that they were very specific and they were very big. Like you would think that you would sort of say things that were a bit more low-key. So that it's not as big a clangor. Yeah. Did it almost make it easier to believe because it was so over the top? And you'd think, who could make that up? Well, I didn't, I kind of didn't believe him, but what I, I didn't believe him, but what I thought was, I just think maybe he's trying to impress me. Yeah, right. And I thought, 
wow, you know, st- stupidly. Like, and I thought, okay, so he can say all of that and it might not be true, but that's his story. It's not hurting me. It's what his imagined story of his life is and why, how he explains where he is right now. Did you ever Google him? Yeah, because he knew I would Google him. So I saw all of that and it's always that stupid, that silly thing they always talk about, Gabrielle Richens, The Pleasure Machine. Yes, that Who came up. Gabrielle Richens, The Pleasure Machine, she was like a sexy kind of model, yeah, so but like eyebrows. glamour sort of model. Yeah. Not an editorial model particularly. And she was, I seem to remember she was with some high profile footballer uh. and either his relationship or his marriage ended and he sort of ran off to be with her. Wow. And how did she end up with Hamish? I don't know. I so remember he would talk about her. He would, would talk he? about her and he would talk about her mother. And apparently she and her mother lived with him in Palm Beach. But again, Gabrielle was a, a raging alcoholic and, you know, would throw scotch glasses at him and stuff. According so, to him. According to him. Um, wow, which of he seems every single woman that he dated turned out to be an alcoholic I and know. an unreliable witness. Yeah, I know. And So when you Googled him and you found reams of stuff about yeah. dodgy business dealings in Canada and people saying he'd stolen millions of dollars, yeah, this is still in the early stages. Yeah. What did you think? Well, I think I thought, because he'd said, I'm going to tell you because you'll Google me. And so he'd given me the backstory. I Googled it and went, I think I thought, well, he's not in jail. He hasn't been arrested. Like he's mm. maybe what he's saying is true. Because if you do all this really bad stuff, how is he walking around Bluey's Beach? But in saying that, his older sister is best friends with my older sister, which is just this weird connection. And I had never put that together until we started seeing each other because my older sister, Ruth, is 60, her um, best friend from having little kids was this woman, Penny Janu. So I knew Penny, but I didn't realise. That must have made you feel more secure it, as well. It did. Because he was oriented in your world. Yeah, it did. And um, although my sister had said, Penny said, be really careful, you know, be really careful, Beck. Um, and I said, yeah, I, I get it. But I think that you're right that I had never thought about that the fact that because he was already somehow a part of my family in a way it made me feel safer maybe I don't did, so was it quite whirlwind I mean he yes, obviously yes yes did a number on you in terms of interest in the boys lightening your load was it like a, this passionate no hot and heavy thing <sighs> absolutely not and The weirdest thing is I'll never forget. So the first night we'd done the James Bond thing and then we get home and I'm like, okay, let's get the wine and see what happens. Because I think, you know, you've got to You're a grown-up. Yeah. And we were sort of kissing and it was not very nice, to be honest, but I kind of was trying to move it to basically have sex with him (laughs) just to see. You've got to test the water. But he wouldn't. He said the weirdest thing. He said, if I have sex with you, I will own you. I remember, I still don't understand what that was about, but he said, I want you to make sure you want to be with me before we do that. I mean, what guy does that? Anyway, so then I start going and he'd go, I've got to go because, you know, I just, I don't want to do this, don't want to do this. You know, we need to, you just need to know that you are mine and... That's quite manipulative too, isn't it? Well, I'm thinking, it's just so strange. I mean... Who uh, Who turns down sex with a hot girl? (laughs) Well, yeah, and, like, if we're thinking we're going to be in a, like, take this forward. So he moved quite slowly, sort of infiltrating my little unit. And I wasn't particularly attracted to him physically at all. But I didn't care. It was like... You liked the person that he was. Yeah. That you thought he was. That I thought he was. And that's never been a thing for me. I mean... My ex-husband's the hairiest man I've ever seen and people would probably think he's quite gross, but I was just so in love with him. When did you finally sleep together? Oh, I think it took about seven weeks or something after that, so it would have been around New Year-y time. And was it amazing? It was probably about three minutes. He had to have a shower first. Oh. He even told me, how weird's this? He used to say, I like to peroxide my penis. What? Yeah. 
What does that even mean? You I, couldn't I don't put even your know. penis in peroxide. It'd could fall you put off. It, could you put like it on a dab it on a? I don't think so. But I don't know. And I'm thinking, is that because you're worried about me, or is that like? Uh, it was sexy. really weird. He's never touched. He's n- never had his hand inside my underpants ever. There so was he n- never touched you. Never. He'd touch my boobs. Which I was always a bit conscious of because I've fed three kids. You mm, know what it's like. I do. Um, and they're not fabulous. I really do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Wind socks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's bad, isn't it? Can be. But I'm just embracing that. I don't of care. Of course. Now. But um, they've done good things. Our boobs. They have done great things. Yeah. I'm so proud of them. Every scar and one longer than the other. But um, I don't think he was into women. I've always said that. And as he turned into this freaky character this whole other person that I don't recognize you know I look at photos and go that's a gay man like he the people he idolized were men he never never talked about women although I have learned that he has was was having a lot of flings in Potts Point with people and he was sleeping with Jane but no he definitely wasn't you know he wouldn't come and grab me and like want to rip your clothes off or anything if we had sex it would be you know, we'd had a few wines, you know, we'd go to bed. It'd be like, like he would never want to look at you. It'd just, he'd be behind me. He'd just, and I, I can remember just going, this is just the worst. And at one mm. stage I, in the early days, I thought, you know what, Beck, suck it up. You're taking one for the team because this is a family and this could be really good for us. And I thought, if I've got to just give up having sex to create having something good secure. Sex. Yeah. Having and that can really affect your self-esteem. Well, he did used to always tell me, like, you know, if you tried, you could look pretty good. <gasps> All the time. And that was a really awful thing for me. It made me feel like that's when I started feeling like I was losing the grip on my kids as well because, you know, I, it was so important to me to raise three men that are feminists yeah. and just decent people. And he'd say that in front of the boys. All the time. And then he would convince them and they would go, it's true, mum. Like, honestly, like, because I just do no exercise. I'm, I mean, I walk the dogs, but I'm not the type of person who wants to go to the gym and, I don't know, do sit-ups before bed. But because people can't see you, I just have to say, you'd be, what, a size six? You're I tiny. Know. You're teeny weeny. Well, like, I think maybe I had put on a bit of weight. But, like, I was never a big girl. And regardless of what size you were, any man that says that to you is not a good man. Yeah, and I, I used to say, um, but hey, like, I'm, in, I'm 40, in my 40s. I've had three children. I'm doing all right. And, and then he would name supermodels who had children. Oh, God. Yeah, and he would push me to go, come on, we'll go for a run. He gave me a bikini for Christmas saying it was incentive for me to get. There's a gap here because you say when you met him, he was overweight, mm-hmm. he was not really interested in clothes or his appearance mm-hmm. and then you referred to a, a time when he sort of made Changed. himself over. That was after you got together? Yeah. So we got together and when we got married in 2010, we, we didn't have any money. We were sort of like scraping together to to do like a little wedding on the veranda and have a reception and it wasn't like he was, I thought, this guy's loaded. This is going to be awesome. I just thought this guy just wants this simple life like I do. He's doing his thing. Business seems to be doing a little bit better. He goes surfing all the time. I love it. But he started, when he started working for Lisa Ho, he started getting really into his body and working out and being paleo. And it just, because he was always into his fitness, but it was more boxing. So he had that body of like a, you know how they're sort of chunky? Not and surfer, surfers, you know, yeah. usually have quite yeah. He athletic was bodies. he was big, but he wasn't ever like like he would be embarrassed at the beach in the beginning to be shirtless. Like he would want he'd get his wetsuit off and have a towel. And I thought that's just the sweetest thing because I don't care what you look like. Mm. You know, I care how cute. Like I mean, I feel I get shy because you know tummy that's had babies, yeah. and I'd be like that. But I thought so is he like. But, but then he, he changed. He changed. And he was doing a lot of work in Sydney, a lot of work with Lisa Ho. He was coming back with these stupid cars. Like he had a ute when I met him, just an old ute. Over what period of time did this happen? It was like 12 months. 
So well, hang on, no, so no, no. Fast. Actually, no, it would have been. So we got married in 2010. Yeah, it was like within 12 months. Tell me about the decision to get married. Do you know, I just, it's, it's a funny thing. I remember he just really wanted to do it and he kept pushing me. To, I hadn't even got divorced. And I, I felt maybe he just loves us so much and he so craves the security of a unit and we can do this. Like, Why do you think you really wanted to get married? Me? Yeah. Because I wanted security. I wanted a family. All I ever wanted was just a unit. I wanted the boys to have a male in their life and be able to do the things I can't do. And he was great with them, right? He because was great with them. in hindsight going, well... He said these awful things and whatever, but he also groomed you. Mm. How did he do that? How did he make you love him? Through the kids, absolutely. And through just always telling me what an incredible mother I was. You know, like, what a great cook. You know, we would have dinners. It was all about family. We never went anywhere without them. We would go on all, anywhere. We would go holidays. It would just be going to the snow. And he would spend hours on the runs with the kids you know, I'd be back at the place making sandwiches and I just kind of thought, this is this is good. Like, I knew I wasn't in love, in love, but I thought maybe this is what it is now. Maybe this is where life goes. And So it was a pretty pragmatic decision to get married in a way. Yeah. And, but, you know, and I say that now, but, like, my girlfriend Tori always goes, Beck, you were stoked. And I was. And I remember yeah. saying, someone going, what are you doing? And I was like, well, what have I got to lose? Like, because I kind of thought, what have I got to lose? So it doesn't work out, whatever. I had no idea that if only I could take those words back and not have almost destroyed my children's lives. When did he start trying to take your money? Straight after we got married, because I didn't really, I didn't have any money. So he'd started with trying to get a divorce settlement, which never eventuated so then he moved on to the house which was my parents it's their holiday house and he was doing well with Lisa Ho and we were making some money saying making money we never had a joint account or anything I just had my account he'd put money in every month for housekeeping and he just did his business stuff no idea he said I've got a big bonus let's go talk to Mal and Sheila about buying the house and I was so excited. Your parents. Yeah. I was so excited because I thought it's all I've ever wanted and maybe this can happen. And so we had this lunch and like my dad is, he'll be 90 this year. So he was 80. So he's still elderly, but he's a really smart cookie. And, you know, he let Hamish do the spiel and Hamish is just so good at talking. It was all about... Malcolm and Sheila, I want to give this to Beck and the boys. I want them to have the security. And I'm sitting there looking at him going, oh, I'm so in love. This is so great. And they said, you know, we're going to go away and think about it. They then called me, Dad called me and said, look, we just don't feel comfortable about this at the moment. But he was going to give them money. Is that what he was saying? Or there was a catch? There's he was always gonna, a catch. Well, I don't know. He was going to buy the house because he had some right. massive bonus. So he wanted to buy the house from them. So he would have given them cash and then we would have had a small mortgage. Why did your parents say no? Because they're not stupid. Because they knew. Like it, he said to me in retrospect, Beck, over my dead body, was I going to do that? They knew. And mm. I mean, that's this really incredibly hard thing about being a parent because in some ways, you know, I can say, why didn't you? And I've said it to girlfriends, grab me and shake me. But you can't because that might have then completely changed my relationship with my parents. And at that stage, I would have probably backed Hamish. And my, it happens by degrees, doesn't it? It happens by degrees, very slowly. Mm. And the same thing with my girlfriend. She said, you know, we wouldn't be friends now. You would have just told me to fuck off. And I would have. What else did he try to take? I think that was when I noticed once he didn't get that, he knew he wasn't going to get anything from me. So that's when he started talking to Jack's girlfriend's grandparents. So your eldest son's girlfriend, Jane, yeah. lived in the house with you. Yeah. That's not her real name, but that's the name that, that you've chosen to give her. Yeah. She was living in the house. She had a dysfunctional family life. So you'd sort of taken her in as a surrogate. 
yeah, I mean, daughter when, in a way. Yeah, she was when 15. Were, she was 15 when they were dating. It was cute. She has a great stepdad that I'm good friends with, but she was a rough time, really rough. She so, had a rough time. So you provided a stable house. Yeah, it was like playing happy families. And so was she already living in your house when you met no, Hamish? No, we got married before she entered the picture. And then she moved in. And when did you first start feeling uncomfortable about his relationship with her, your son's girlfriend? Probably when they were in. So she was in year 10 when they got together, in year 11. So so she was, what, 17, 16, 17? 16, 17. 17. So she would be, you know, Jack and her were just in love. So they're just like in la-la land and all over each other. And they'd come up for breakfast in the morning and she wouldn't have much on just like a girl would be hanging around with their family. Mm. Yeah, and so he'd start doing things like they'd be washing up and he'd like flick her bum with the tea towel and kind of stuff like that. Flirty. And flirty. And uh, like it's so bizarre how your body reacts to seeing something like that, like just that. And I just straight away went, that makes me feel some sort of weird thing here and I'm going to have to say something. And so he was doing stuff like that and I'd – approach him and go hey listen like you know how you do that flicking a bum thing like it's just not cool like she's you know and he'd go get over yourself for fuck's sake Beck. like she's Jack's girlfriend she's a kid she's like my daughter then they sort of started training and hanging out a lot together and um he'd take her on runs and they'd do triathlons and Jack would be involved too like they they're all super fit I'm so not fit so they'd all go running together People would see them out on paddle boards when I was at work and just doing... So sometimes they'd just be off by themselves, Hamish and Jane. Often. People would say they'd see them in the cafe having a coffee together. And did you say something to your son? Did you say something to him, to her? How do you even handle that? I started with saying it to Hamish, which of course he's like, yeah, we're just running, like we're whatever. I started saying it to Jack going, hey... Are you okay with like the amount of time they're spending together? Um, and he's like, "Yeah, why wouldn't I be?" And I so and so I couldn't go in and go because I think something's going on. Then all the talk of because she was super, she is super clever girl, super clever. She was school captain year ten, school captain year twelve. You know, on every kind of mm. you know whatever program at the school, and she was really smart, and she wanted to do finance, so. That was... I wonder if that was her idea or his. I wonder that too now. So this meant that Hamish, who had always told me he'd worked for a guy called... And he was very good friends with this guy. This guy had an apartment in the same building in Woolloomooloo. That was another thing that happened during this creation of Hamish, Hamish's new kind of fancy suit wearing creepy Botox thing. You've got um, Botox? Yes. I'll show you after. I've got this photo that I found. It's of just his head of what he looked like when I met him in 2008 and a photo that Tracy Hall had given me of what he looked like just before he got arrested. That's the, the woman that he sort of tried to scam just before, did scam before he just Max got arrested. Max Tavita. She lost all her superannuation. The most gorgeous woman. Love her. Like that's becoming friends with her and some of the other people has just been... This cactus flower Bonds, of the story. Bonds forged in fire. Yeah. So he had Botox. Did you know that he'd had Botox? Well, you could tell. Did you ask him? Yes. What and did he, he say, say no? And then he'd say, I don't dye my hair. And I'd go, but your hair was grey. <laughs> and he's like, no, it's just from the sun or some <gasps> shit. And I'd go to the hairdresser <sighs> in Potts Point where I used to go when I was in Sydney. And I'd go, Andrew come on, what are you doing? He goes, yeah. He brings in, he used to bring into the hairdresser a picture of Daniel Craig and he'd want his hair to look like that. And we used to just piss ourselves laughing. So he was incredibly vain. So vain, like so vain. So he would get ready. Really different to the guy you met in Blueys. Like and polar opposites, with. yeah, polar opposites. And like I wouldn't be able to give him a hug because it might mess his hair up or – you know, so many times I remember just going to, I don't know, the local pizza place and I'd be sitting on the couch with Birkenstocks and jeans on and he'd be, don't even know, taking half an hour to get his hair right or weird. And what do you think that was about? I think, I think when he lost, when he started getting really fit and lost weight and he had Jane's interest 
and was in Sydney a lot, I think he realised that perhaps I wasn't what he needed and I think he was probably getting ready for the next chapter of his life, which was being this guy who lives in Sydney who's super fit and super hot and drives around with cars and possibly has a 17-year-old girlfriend. You suspected that they were sleeping together. Yeah. You confronted everyone. You went to counselling with him. He even managed to convince the counsellor <laughs> who begged you to, to stop making these accusations. Begged. How did you finally find out that it was true? Because I was so suspicious and this was the, probably one of the lowest times of my life and so suspicious and no one would listen. They all just thought like, Jack, I think, thought I was jealous that he was showing attention to a 17-year-old. But I remember I'd just randomly go and turn up at the apartment in Sydney and Jane's stuff would be through the apartment. And I'd go, well... That's That's a smoking gun. That's a smoking gun. And he'd go, no, she was here with her sister. They went to a concert. They stayed the night. There's some of her stuff. And I'm like, but there's her hairbrush and her book on my side of the bed. There's her cosy downstairs. And he would just tell me I was go oh, look, being paranoid over it yeah you're so paranoid get over it what would she, he always used to say why would she be interested in an old guy like me and I think he almost secretly wanted me to say because you're so amazing and you know I think he secretly you know one time I remember going and opening the dryer and there was like a purple g-string and I'm like a cotton bonds undies girl and I was like what's this and he went well, how should I know? And I said, <laughs> it's your house. It's, 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 yeah. And he goes, oh, fuck, I don't know. Maybe it was the cleaners. And I'm like, cleaners don't do laundry at your house. So he was just, every time you caught him in a lie with like com- absolute evidence, mm. he would just, what, just be just completely like, confident. Yeah. Just like, what are you talking about? Have another wine. Get over Ooh. it. Yeah. And what did you do about telling your son? Well, it was interesting because what happened was on the down low in the community, I was just really struggling. Hamish was back and forth to Sydney. What I didn't realise that a lot of community members were aware that this was going on and kind of people said to me, we wondered if you were okay with it or what was going on. So it was actually a Jane's stepfather who rang me and said, Beck, I want to have a little chat with you. Are you home? And I said, yes, I'm home. Come round. And so he came round and he said, look, I, he said, I, he said, I've seen you walk around and you, I'm worried about you because you look like shit. I know things are bad, but you need to know that Hamish has been having an affair with Jane and it's been going on for a long time. He, he has come to me and told me that he wants to marry Jane, which of course Jane's stepfather was like, are you fucking nuts? Hamish, you're married to Beck. Um, and Jane's she, meant to be going out with Beck's son. Yeah. And he was furious with his stepdaughter and worried about it because she was being completely groomed and drawn into this just mm. hideous situation. And I remember going, you're fucking kidding. And he goes, yeah, I, I thought maybe you were okay with it. I've called her grandparents and we've tried, you know, to because I can't believe everyone's okay with this. Um, but you need to know this. And I was so grateful. Um, And he said, and she needs to tell you too. So he called her and then she called me. And told you the truth. Yeah. How long had it been going on for? uh, We don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. So I don't know, like a year maybe. On the phone she'd said, you know, she was crying and she was so sorry. That was in February 15. So by the end of 2013... Things were not going so well with Jack and Jane, which I was kind of secretly happy about. And I found out she'd gone away for school. Is you know, there's big dramas in Year 12 and she'd hooked up with someone else. And so I knew that and I couldn't tell Jack because – so I kind of was getting his friends and going, come on, just – you've got to talk to him because he's going to be heartbroken. Was she still living in your house? She was, she was spending a lot more time in Sydney with Hamish, but she was still in the house. Did you ever think of asking her to leave? I guess you couldn't because then couldn't. that would Jack be more proof of your paranoia. Yeah, and Jack would have never spoken to me again. Oh, Beck. So you just, you know, it's that thing where you can't. Stuck. You can see it all. Yeah. It's lose-lose for you. It's lose-lose. 
And so you just got to write it out and hope that it f- comes out, which it did. But anyway, Jack and Jane broke up. Jack was devastated, you know. And, you know, it's awful seeing... Oh, I can't imagine. You know, any of your kids heartbroken. Yeah. So anyway, so that was cool. And then 14 was a really tough year because... We, Hamish was spending a lot more time in Sydney. I was really over him. I was really happy he wasn't up with us. Jane had moved to Sydney after year 12 and was living in an apartment in Elizabeth Bay. He made up this whole thing about her... Oh, the internship. ...interning oh, with this friend of his and she was going to get a scholarship to Princeton. So that was in year 11 or 12. Did she think that was true? Did he tell the same story to her or were they? did they conspire to just... Oh, that's, this is a good way to just... I think she thought it was true, but I think mm. she doubted it because I think when they went, she told me they did do one walkthrough of the university because, you know, I, w- that was such a clincher point for me because he'd sort of kept talking about, you know, he's going to give her a scholarship and, and they would have, you know, conversations with the grandparents and it was all happening and it's so great and we were sitting having pizza and he goes, I, I remember Hamish had bought this like $100 bottle of red wine and Jack didn't drink, so he'd poured three glasses. And I'm thinking, fuck off. Like, you're not giving a 17-year-old girl $100, you know, like a glass of wine. He's, we need to celebrate. The internship's happening. We're going in three weeks. She's going with and a chaperone. It's going to be fantastic. And I just got up and walked away because I, I just, my stomach dropped. And I just thought, they're actually going to go travelling together and they're trying to make all of us believe that this is about... A scholarship. I remember talking about the scholarship in counselling and I had gone nuts Googling this company and scholarships. There was no such thing as a scholarship that involved taking someone to America and paying for a university education at Princeton. But all of her family were on board and everyone thought it was great. And Meanwhile, he'd taken all her grandparents' life savings. Yep. Which and derailed her whole life because she was a smart kid, right? She- so she could have done something and she gone could have places. done something and he used that over her by to get to her grandparents money because I was like why did he target her both things though he used it to I reckon to get to the grandparents money and then to keep her like by his side because she was frightened that they would lose their money and you know I mean Hamish used to threaten people if you went to the police you weren't going to get your money back so I think he desperately wanted Jane, because he liked the guy who he idolised and has been his lifelong friend, has a partner who's a lot younger than him. And they met on the boardwalk at Bondi and she was rollerblading or something and he was in his 30s and she was 18 or some some story. And Hamish just thought that was just the most amazing thing. I remember talking about it in counselling and the professor going, you do realise that's not really an appropriate what you know relation yeah. and Hamish didn't get it he cried he was so upset that the guy was saying something nasty about who he idolized so then off they go I and I I gave him the ultimatum of saying because he came to me and said you're never going to guess I've actually got to go overseas for business oh, God. yeah and he I, was so brazen I've got to go overseas at the exact same time that Jane is also going to be overseas yeah. but I'm going to go to China and I might have to pop into San Fran um and I went you're not going with them. And yes, because China and San Francisco yeah. are very close. Yeah, so close. And, and he's, It's a common stopover. He, he used to say China all the time. I'm thinking, what? Anyway. What did you find out had actually happened on that trip? They just went away together. They just went away together. They went away together. They had a holiday for two and a half year, weeks in New York. And he admitted to you afterwards, oh, we just ran into each other at LAX. and yeah, That's exactly what he said because I'd given him the ultimatum. So back... You know, listening to it back, you can't help but wonder, why did you not kick him to the curb? Why did you not say enough, the lies, the lies, I've caught you, I've caught you, I've caught you. To someone who doesn't understand Mm, the emotional manipulation, how do you explain how you justified it to yourself? All I kept thinking was the boys. I kept thinking, I've fucked up before. And put them through a shit relationship and they are so damaged. I need to do anything I can to try and not let that happen again. 
And in saying that, I had been trying to break up with him, like trying to extract myself. But he would beg me. He would get the psychologist to ring me. And I've read the emails. The emails. I only yeah. read them the other day and I had not thought about them in a long persuasive. time. persuasive. But why? Why do you think because I he think wanted – like what purpose did you serve at this point? I think it, he couldn't get the house. He couldn't get the house but all I could – He didn't want to have sex with you. Yeah, he didn't want to have sex. I think – it made him look legitimate. It made him look like a good guy to have taken on a woman with three kids. It made him look like a saviour. And, you know, it, and Lisa Ho says it. She said that was one of the reasons she trusted him because she's a single mother herself, like a man who does that. So I think as much as, I mean, he, there were times he'd just look at me like he despised me. I remember being in the apartment. It was my birthday. My twin sister was there. I went to open a bottle of champagne. He goes, you're just a drunk. Look at you. And, <sighs> and sitting on the table were a couple of Zimmerman bags. And I was like, oh, he's got a present. And they were for Jane. He's like, oh, I've just picked them up for Jane. Um, so I think... The cruelty and the cruel. brazenness. It's pretty, pretty... How did you finally get out of there? Um, when I found out about Jane, I just went, that's it. We got him on the phone, on speaker, and told him... Who's we? The boys and I. Because they were furious because, because it had been so hard with all of us. You know, it was such a fractured time in the family. And they really didn't like me much. They were like, Mum, stop being so mean to him. You know, stop it, Mum. Like, and if I'd ask him, we'd have an argument and I'd ask him to leave, Jet would cry and go why are you doing this? Like, why, mum? And So he'd made you into the bad guy with your own children. Yep. And I thought stamping my feet and trying to convince them, and they're too young to understand this stuff, is just going to make it worse. So it was that lose-lose again. Mm. It was just like I just got to hang on until I have the courage and the strength to go, fuck this, mm. which was when I found out about Jane and I we, we had the open conversation on the phone and I said, we're, all, we're on speaker um, and we've found out, blah, blah, blah. And he just denied it all. It's complete bullshit. Um, I said, I want all your shit out. He said, you can pack it up and take it to this house. This is his mate who's got a house up in Blueys as well. And then, you know, he, we had like, I don't know, a bit more contact after that and then he just cut us. So he completely didn't, wasn't coming up to the house at all. I think he came up in... December 14, we had Christmas and it was miserable. It was Did he just, say goodbye to the boys? No, he just kept saying to the boys, I'm sorry, your mum's such a freak. And by then the boys were like, mum's not a freak. Like, we don't want anything to do with you. Um, How was Jack? Oh, he was, he was devastated. What a gut punch for him. What a gut punch. And doubly so. The he, double dub betrayal That was it. And, and that was the, the hardest thing because... He's a really gentle kid and watching him go through all of that was so hard. So he'd finished school. He was going to Newcastle, going to uni, which was great. So that was good. But emotionally, I just, I, you know, as a mum, you know, I was really worried about mm. him. He was highly anxious and I get anxious. I'm I was not surprised. So, so I'm anxious just listening to you. And he, oh, poor him. Like, and so we... I found someone for him to talk to. So mm. we did like a while of therapy and then he'd feel better and then he'd sort of stop and go back. But honestly, up until doing that, talking to Greg, like having that chance. Greg being? Greg Bearup from The Australian. So That was a huge decision for Jack to make, to speak to Greg Bearup on the podcast. Massive, because he didn't want to be involved. And like I told you, when I first kind of, he asked me, I don't know how it all works. And then he came up for that chat and we sat there for like five hours and and Jack walked through because we were getting ready for a party and Greg said, you know, do you want to have a chat? And he said, oh, no, no, you know, and he's quite shy. And that was totally fine. I was like absolutely wasn't even – didn't cross my mind that the boys would be involved in it. But um, I remember after he heard that episode three where I'd spoken and he rang me and he goes, Mum – I just regret that I didn't talk to Greg. Like, I really regret this. And I said, well, I'm sure, let, you know, if you want to have a chat, I mean, you don't have to interview. If you want to just talk to him, like... And so I got in contact with Greg and he just went straight up 
to Newcastle and Jack was really nervous. He but, was came across so well. Oh. And did that help him? Uh, massively. He is like it's just he's lighter. He's speaking like, it out loud. And he that? got to say his how how he felt and did you find the same for you? Absolutely. Like the 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 strength in a podcast, the strength in being able to tell your story. Yeah. And we don't have anything to hide. I mean, I'm you know, we're all embarrassed and we all go, we all got hoodwinked like every single person. But I find it really empowering to actually admit all the stupid mistakes and admit that he fed me the most ridiculous lines and I just kept letting him be part of our lives. And I, I think it's important to share that because if I had my time again, I'd trust my gut. You know, I would work out a different way of handling the children. But it's good to reflect and, and go, holy fuck, like, wh- you know, how did I – I have this incredible guilt about putting the children through that and another really awful time. But then I I guess I kind of – this process and also sort of looking at how our relationship built in trying to put everything back together – has been massive, like has been like, I don't know, resilience 101 with the boys. Like they're just incredible. Listening to the podcast, are there a lot of stories that you didn't know and that yeah. have surprised you to hear? Yep. Stacks. Is it upsetting to hear those stories or is it there's safety in numbers and there's kind of like, yeah, it's it a, wasn't just me? Because you feel stupid, right? You do feel stupid. It's a kind of weird feeling. There is a bit of like, you know, that stab of like someone not being honest and and wanting to be with another woman, like that sort of level, even though he didn't really want to be with me. But I think the the most interesting thing I've found emotionally thinking about from doing this is that he actually never had any capacity to love me. Like realising in my head that that whole thing was – he never loved me. There was no emotion. He's incapable of that. That's a weird thing because I sort of still thought, oh, he loved, you know, he loved me and look, he went off the rails again. I mean, that's in a really simplistic way, but I think realising he never did. He never loved me. He needed me to get to the next step. He thought maybe at that time when he was fat surfy dude, maybe he thought if we could scam a house and we could live there, that'd be good. But then you know, something always better came along and it didn't work out like that with me. But he just, yeah, he needed me to look like he's supporting a family up the coast. I remember when he was living in Bondi, he'd moved to Bondi. And I said, where in Bondi are you? And he's like, I don't know the address. And I went, (laughs) but you had to get a (laughs) removalist, didn't you? And he went, look, I don't know the address. I'll draw you a map. It's, have another drink, back. Have another drink. It's such a girl thing to want to know stuff like that. Oh. And I said, "Wow, gaslighting!" It's gaslighting, such a girl. And I was like, "But you're my husband. Like, I need to. anyway." So I found where he lived, and he'd apparently gone overseas for work. And I, like, I'd do crazy things, like just turn up because I was finding all these loans, and it was in Knotts Avenue in those white, you know, right on yeah, the corner. right on the beach. And right where Harry and Megan pulled up when they yeah, went for their beach exactly walk. exactly there. And I remember finding out and talking to him on the phone. I was like, I went down. I've seen where you live. And he goes, I am working two jobs. I life save at, Ma- at Maroubra and at Bondi all so I can support you two. And this is what you're complaining to me about, that I live in a nice apartment. And just, How much money did you lose? Um, I didn't really, nothing really. I'm just lost in in the fraudulent stuff he's left me in because I didn't have any money. So he took loans out in your name? Yeah, forged my signature. Dad and I spent two years. So it's about $450,000 worth of loans that are still... That you have to untangle. I have to untangle. Are you liable for those loans? Yes. Yep. We've spent two years, Dad and I, trawling through them. Like, because Dad found me a solicitor when I wanted to get divorced that was would do, do it pro bono. So he was kind of helpful. He said to me, I think I'd got received one letter with a demand notice for a car and I had no idea what it was about. And he'd suggested get a mail redirection from Hamish's where Hamish is staying in Bondi for anything addressed to you. So we started finding these loans. We'd go down to the Porsche dealership where the loans were taken out and they admitted, you know, they'd witnessed my signature and I wasn't there. 
So how are you liable for that? Because apparently that doesn't matter. <gasps> apparently it doesn't matter. One of the cars was the Audi that Jane was driving. And I remember calling her going, babe, you know your car, it's, it's apparently it's mine and it's got all this money owing and we're going to have to sort it out. And she went, I can't afford to pay for that. And then the other cars were ones I hadn't seen. And What's happened to Jane? Um, she is up the coast working in a dress shop. And so, so she never got her no. university education. And it kills me because, you know, and Jack has just completed a degree and, and Jane just got fucked over massively. Mm. And she's like, she just feel like shit. You know, she's mm. so, she always said, I'm not going to let this define my life. Like she's, she got pretty cranky with me in the end because I went through this period of like, I need to know everything, but she didn't, she'd admitted it and that's all she wanted to do. And you know, when you're a crazy person, when you want to find out. You're not a crazy person. Well, you're a very reasonable person who wanted to try and unravel all the lies you'd been told over years. That's well, yeah. I've, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it funny how you take that on? I know. It's like that becomes your identity. Have you watched Dirty John? Yes. How did that feel? Oh, oh I felt so, yeah, it, it was great. I was like, yes, I know that. I mean, I'd read stuff about people who have this condition. And, you know, when I was, you know, I'd read things and just go tick, 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 tick. Psychopaths. Psychopaths. Mm. Um, and I don't know, it's funny. Like we always say, Jack and I always talk about it and go, oh, does that let him off? Does that let him off saying he's a psychopath? But I don't don't think so. I mean, I don't know. He he. When I just hear the stories, and there are so many of lives he's just destroyed, I think we we were lucky. Like, with no remorse. Yeah, with, and he slept like a baby, like like a baby. He was never anxious. I always wondered about that. I've always thought. The level of stress knowing that you've got all these people chasing you, you and that you're lying, you've got to keep all these lies straight to all these different people and all these people are after you. Mm. How how would you sleep at night? How would you cope with that? Occasionally I'd see him. He would go to bed at 8.30. He'd be like asleep. Probably that was to avoid having to So he sex. didn't seem stressed? Not at all. Sometimes we both would wake up in the night. And roll over and we'd just, you know, like you do, shoot the shit. Oh, you know, I'm thinking this or what about, you know, mm. and just really relax. And then we'd fall asleep again and I'd wake up and he was just getting up to go for an early morning surf. There was not any, I, a couple of times I've seen him a bit stressed, but he would make out and he'd be on the phone and he'd make out like clients were so greedy and clients were... You know, they didn't, they didn't understand what was going on. In fact, one lady who I actually wrote her, someone I knew, wrote her an email saying, you need to back off from Hamish because I went into full protective wife mode going, listen, you maybe you don't understand the way it works. Hamish has explained this to me and it's everything's okay. Like this was a, she, this woman got her money back, but that's how good he was that I, I felt like I needed to protect him. But when he found out I'd done that, he was furious. He was like, don't you ever um, contact any. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah. Beck, how do you date again? I just don't. <laughs> There's no, um, you know, like, and like I'm, in my work it's great because you're out, you're talking to people and it's holiday people and that's kind of good, that's fine for me. And I've got two border collies that are just, I worship, and the boys and I, I think I'm a bit of an introvert really. Like I like... I'm totally happy to go home and shoot the shit about maths with the boys and have dinner and a wine and go for a walk in the morning and have a swim and go to work. What about trusting people? Yeah, I'm, look, I'm, t look, no, I, I don't think that that's really, I don't think I'd ever think that I would be involved with someone like Hamish. Like, I don't think, I think that that situation is so one of a kind um, someone said to me, you must just hate men. And I was like, I could, I love men. I, A, I could never hate them because I'm raising three of them. Mm. And I don't know. And, it, you know, in my little fishbowl, dating's not really an option. It's either 65-year-olds who invite you to go and get a schnitzel at the recce. 
which is sweet, or horrible married men that have holiday houses oh. and families. We need to get you into a bigger town. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. But, you know, like it's, I'm like, I'm really happy. We're you seem a, really happy. We're in a good place and, yeah. and like the boys are good. Like it's just, I just feel like, and, and we, we don't need anyone. So I think that's really important to know. You know, I think I was so needy and I've learnt it's bullshit. You don't need – I mean, I'm never going to be a millionaire. And, or, I mean, that would never even matter to me whether or not I ever get to own my own house or it just really, like, prioritise what's important and that's, you know, the most important people in your life, those guys. They're pretty good. Well, you're an incredible mother, oh, an incredible woman and so generous for sharing your story oh, because – there are a lot of people out there, um, whether they were, you know, manipulated by Hamish or, or other people who will recognise what you say and their awesome. wounds are in the shape of your words and you'll help a lot of people I by telling so. this story. I just, just like wish I could just scream to every person who's in, who, who ever questions their intuition, their yeah. gut feeling, to just don't like listen to it and be strong and follow it and believe in yourself. Thanks for listening to No Filter. If you want to hear more of Beck's story and see some of the photos that she showed us of Hamish, including some absolutely mind-bending before and afters his transformation, search Hamish Mamma Mia or look for the link in the show notes for this episode. And if you've found yourself in a messy separation, it doesn't have to be as messy as Beck's, but breakups and separations and divorce are really, really hard. You will want to go and listen to our new separation and divorce podcast. It's called, fittingly, The Split. No Filter is produced by Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman, and I'll see you on Mamma Mia.